Okay, welcome to May 2012 in a Victory Garden. And let's see if we can get through May. I've got quite a few pictures. Uh, so we'll try to go through them all. If not, you know, we'll just split May up into two slideshows. And then we'll get into June eventually. And this, this is May 1st. And I'm doing some chopping of our comfrey. We've got three comfrey plants that we're growing here since last year. They really, really do well in this location, uh, outside of the fence and everything. Uh, they do get a little bit of shade, but once they get going in the summer, they grow immensely large. And you can see I've already chopped one of the three, and its droppings are down the bottom right-hand corner. I've also got the worm bins out because I'm <clears throat> going to do some harvesting and consolidating because I had done an experiment where I was trying to get the worms to eat uh, dog waste but they for some reason I guess it's something our dog what our what we feed our dogs uh, they don't want to even touch after months including having bedding and everything so that was it was pretty nasty <laughs> but anyway, here's here's our, our cuttings from three comfrey plants and that's a lot of biomass from three plants um, again they're I remember talking in the last episode where I would want to chop them before they flower. As you can see, they've already flowered in this stage. And remember, they're sterile, so it's okay if they're flowered because they're not going to uh, be able to ripen and set seed. So I don't need to worry about that with this variety, which is a really nice uh, frame of mind to have. Not frame of mind, but something to keep in mind. Yeah, if you're going to be doing chop and drop um, with the pervasive species like comfrey, you know, you know, if you can grow the Russian comfrey, the Bocking 14 cultivar in your climate zone. I, I highly recommend that one because the ease of mind, that's what I was looking for, ease of mind that comes with this variety is um, it's very good. And I also use some of this as bedding in the worm bins. Um, the worms just love digesting it. It goes down real quick. And uh, so yeah, I use things for multiple applications. You know, I'm not just going to harvest the comfrey just for mulching or just for uh, the worm bins. Try to spread out your endeavors and keep things fresh, keep things different, so that way you're always doing something, uh, you know, slightly off pattern, so you're always exploring new opportunities and having multiple projects going on at once is, is good, especially if you're, you have to have some kind of limit, of course. But here's the three after they're already gone. You know, this whole space was filled up with comfrey plants, so now it's gone. And they're going to reshoot, you know, within a couple days. I think I'll have some pictures later on. You'll see just how long it takes for them to rebound. It's not very long. This is uh, some wild plant that was growing in uh, the side yard where we don't have anything going on. And you can see there's a few more in the background. What I'm looking at is this plant with a big flower stem. And don't know what it is. It's pretty. I like it. Uh, it would be neat for it to go to seed and bring it into the garden and uh, really take a closer look at it because we do mow this every once in a while. Once the grass starts to go to seed, we'll we'll mow it. And here's a closer picture of the flowers. You know, it looks like it's in the mint family or some kind, which of course doesn't say much because the mint family is absolutely massive. Uh, but you know, if you've ever grown basil or chia, uh, almost anything, you you can see that the similarity in this flower spike is very striking. Here are some seeds from Black Locust. I really like these seeds. Uh, they're really attractive. You'd almost pass them by for some kind of pebble or stone. And we ordered these from JL Huntsman. Uh, I'll try to put a link onto the slideshow video. I've never done that before. We'll see if I can get it in there. Uh, they're a seed bank out of California and uh, they do preservation through dissemination is their uh, sort of slogan. And we ordered a lot of our wild plant seeds from them because their pricing is spot on, their quality is top notch, and you get so much more seed that you, for a very small investment. So uh, I heard of, of them through permies.com. I think it was Paul Wheaton who brought them up. But, um, you know, exploring different seed companies, they, they, they have a different ordering process than a lot of these other more... Um, advanced nurseries or whatever you know but the, you have to actually send them an email with uh you know uh, just these codes and everything laid out specifically how you want to do it you pay them through paypal so they're not quite as uh you know modern as some of these other nurseries might be that you order from but the seeds are seeds and they do a splendid job so i can't recommend them enough 
Here are little compost tea sausages. You know, this is about 80% potting soil, a lot of humid acid. There are microorganisms in here. Uh, so that is going to help increase the amount of nutrition that's going into this compost tea. You don't need all that much vermicompost, really. You really don't. The vermicompost, you can see at the top end of both of these. These are old pantyhose. You just stuff them and uh, tie them up and put them in. They work really well. A lot of air and water can move through them. Uh, but the worms can't escape if there are any worms still in your vermicompost. But they, this makes a really excellent tea, and I don't see really too much more to say about that. Let's go to the 2nd of May with some roses. Not in focus. It's kind of a bummer when I got it onto the computer and noticed it wasn't in focus. Um, I'm not sure if it was back focusing or what, but you can see that we've got onions and roses growing together. Uh, it's a good combination. The roses were transplanted uh, while I was away over winter, I think it was, and they were moved from beside the house and put onto the south-facing berm by my father. He doesn't remember doing it, but he was the only one who would move the rose plants. Uh, and so it's it's flowering. We haven't fertilized it or anything. Uh, we're just letting it be. We'll probably have to chop it back this fall uh, just to sort of make it reform or something, but... That'll be left up to my parents. But it's interesting if you look right dead center at this flower that's not in focus, how it looks like there's a, you know, a dozen or so small onions popping up around it. That that's really interesting. How the onions will sometimes put out where they're trying. To, it looks like they're trying to regrow vegetatively. Uh, so I actually broke some of these little onions off and tried to plant them. They died. Uh, but so then other times they'll actually flower. It was it's just really strange um, but pretty cool at the same time just how this picture just showing how thickly the ground cover is growing and I had to be quick with this uh, over way behind the fence and everything I wish it was uh, filling the frame more but we've got a cardinal a robin and I think that's a sparrow and the sparrow is actually turning its head to look at us and so you've got three different species of birds checking out the upper pond uh, which, as you can see, is way, way down in terms of water. Uh, but again, it's we haven't compacted it. We haven't used any uh, any way to actually seal the pond. We're just hoping that over time the pores will close and this heavy clay. Uh, is, you know, we get a clay layer in there. We'll see if that happens. If not, we have some other options in terms of sealing these ponds. But that's just a really good feeling to see that three different species can come down and enjoy the water that you've provided to them. Even if it's not the cleanest water, at least it's water. And that's going to draw a lot of wildlife. And here's another photo of, uh, I guess it's, I don't really, my birds, I don't know my birds very well, besides the obvious ones. This is why we leave our stalks up, you know, as much as possible. Sometimes you need to chop them down to make some space for other plants. But see, he's using that as a perch. Uh, you know, most people are like, oh, that's ugly and dying, it's gross. Uh, well, obviously, wildlife doesn't think so. They don't think about beauty the same way we do. They look for their forms and their niches that they need. And this is something that if you want to bring in predators, or maybe he's not a predator. I don't know what he is, like I said. But, you know, they like being able to sit up high, look around, and be having a clear view so they know what's going on. Um, this is from the first weekend of May, right before... We left for my brother's wedding, and I had a lot of seedlings growing in the new sheet mulch bed, and I wanted to make sure they had an extra layer of mulch because we'd be gone all weekend. So I cut some white clover, and I spread it out all over the beds green. Um, if you want to smother your plants, this is a really good idea. And if you want to kill your seedlings, do this. Hey, this is, this is excellent. Uh, you know, you can, I can chop and drop clean, you know, green mulch on established uh, clover or established ground cover, but you don't want to do this. I, I thought it was going to, I thought I put it on loose enough that it would, uh, you know, take a few days before it dried out or anything, but it turned out that it, since it was wet, it smothered everything when, I, when we came back. There were some plants that were still alive underneath it, but it, I, I'm pretty sure that I killed off most of them, which is a shame, because we had quite a few uh, plants sprouting. Here's just another picture of that rose. It's growing with the flower, uh, with the onions, and you can see the, uh, the onion that I was talking about right behind it. 
And these were, these were just snapshots right before we went off to dinner because uh, we had to leave bright and early the next day to get down to Charleston. So uh, we've got just really quick pictures. Look at how nice and thick this cover crop is. I'm not, you don't, I don't feel bad about leaving this for a few days. You know, there's no exposed soil. There's no exposed mulch. We've got living ground covers going on. So there's a lot of water still in the soil. And these are really hardy plants at this point. But I like to point out how tall our mustard is. Look all the way to the left hand side of the screen. You can see some of the, how tall this mustard grew as it was bolting. That is incredibly tall. I That's tw at least twice as tall as they got the year before when we grew them and they went to seed. Uh, loose, more, better loose soil, longer growing time. I don't know what it was exactly. The conditions are probably a little bit better there because this is May and they're still growing which is it's just Phenomenal, in my opinion. A little bit closer image of how many flowers we have, how much nectar is available for all these insects. We've got comfrey at the bottom left. Surrounding it is still some crimson clover that's trying to eke out some more seed. You've got uh, some mustard that is dangling over by those uh, the, the bird feeders. White clover, red clover, cilantro. And that's just what you can see you know, without zooming in, I would be able to pick out a few more plants. But this is, and this is just a beginning. But look how thick it is, you can see you can't see any pathways or anything. Uh, I haven't been walking through here much because I plan on chopping and dropping in the next couple of days. Now it's at that point that I've been talking about where I wanted to have enough nectar available throughout the whole garden. So as I went from patch to patch, you know, we would have a lot of food available for our burgeoning insect population and, and this photo look at how much cilantro cilantro is these the really tall light green plants with all the white flowers uh, that are growing throughout here with so much cilantro and here you can see where I've gathered some of my white clover from from the green guild and how many how much nectar is available here too and we've got there's mustard these are this all the musters that you see these are all self-sown uh, they and there's some arugula still flowering in here as well because it gets a lot of shade. So we were really happy with the results that we were getting early May through the whole year. It's just been an amazing journey, transformation from last year and the stress test to this. This is the opposite. This is really beautiful. This is, uh, was this like the ninth? Yeah, this is the ninth. So this is after I've come back from Charleston you can see that there's a little bit of a habitat going on here. Remember, this is just a cover crop. You know, this isn't what our garden's going to look like in the final years. This is uh, early secession. It looks kind of messy. Things are competing for space. They're growing up. They're, uh, you know, differentiating the different layers of the garden. All these things are occurring, and it's not going to look nice and formal and neat and everything in its own little box. You don't want it to. You know, that's something we have to discard if we want to actually work with nature. Nature doesn't, like I said, nature doesn't care about our notions of beauty. And so if we try to impose it on the natural world, it just doesn't work. These are some of the sunflowers and peas that we had sown. These didn't grow as well. This, this section here grew a lot slower because it had a lot more shade. And it was also running down the slope. It wasn't on contour. And... I think you'll see some of those later on in June, the ones that are on contour, how they stop some of the water uh, and actually grew a whole lot quicker. This is the plum fully in leaf and there's a lot of grass growing up through the mulch. Remember, I didn't sheet mulch around the, the plum. I just put down mulch. That's all I did. I, I don't really didn't have a lot of sheet mulch material left, didn't really feel like doing it. You don't always have to do that type of thing. We're, remember, we're going to be doing cover crops for three or four years. We'll get rid of the grass eventually, and it's working. Uh, we've got, Now we've got a lot, as you can see in this, there's not a lot of grass here except in the foreground. Uh, the maple is very, very thick now. It's definitely getting some nitrogen from all these nitrogen fixers that are around it. There's a uh, nutrient exchange going on here. Here's some of those sunflowers that grew a whole lot faster. These are right where uh, the temporary fence turns and goes uh, running towards the back fence now. Lots of sunflowers growing there.
And this is how you can see how I smothered everything. The brown, the brown, that room, that was green four days ago. It was green, it was loosely layered, and now it's a sticky mess, unfortunately. That one kind of speaks for itself. Here's one of the blueberry mounds. Grass coming up through it too, but not quite so bad. We try to stay on top of these right now. We haven't put in too many plants yet that are going to do any sort of uh, ground cover for us. Uh, although, they're getting there. They're getting there on the left. This That comfrey plant there on the left, that was transplanted the, earlier this spring. It's one of those transplants I did. And it's already, you know, a meter high. The garlic looks good. Uh, dead center at the bottom uh, is a black-eyed Susan. And right at the base of the black-eyed Susan are tomatoes. These are tomatoes that are coming up by themselves from the year uh, previous. There's another comfrey plant on the right side. Top center is the blueberry bush I've been taking a lot of pictures of. So there's some diversity uh, of the desired species, but there's also undesired species growing in here as well. This is the other blueberry mound, comfrey, lemon balm, uh, blueberries, garlic. There are some tomatoes in here too, but you can't see them in this photo. And this tree that's growing, it's center left. It's just off center. It's the largest plant in here. Uh, the last slideshow I said it was a tree of paradise. It's a tree of heaven. Uh, again, it's still a very invasive plant. Hard to get rid of. Here's our kale that's still flowering underneath the shade from the pine trees. And looking out into the garden. At the bottom center, uh, you should be able to make it out. Maybe not so much in this photo, but I can see it because I knew what I did. And there's comfrey cuttings there because that had a lot of very thin mulch. Uh, so I had to put some comfrey down in order to uh, give it some kind of ground cover. This other pond, we try to keep it relatively full. That's it's probably a normal level right there. It'll stay there for four or five days before it sinks down a little bit more. Uh, so it is definitely sealing. These ponds are actually sealing. We notice that they every month they seem to hold water a little bit better. Uh, so maybe by next year, this will be even filled to the brim longer than ever before. Last picture from this day, just looking out. Uh, this pic these photos didn't turn out too well, unfortunately. The, the lighting was just so uh, stark, and I hadn't gotten into create. I don't have a very good uh, tripod yet, so creating HD. I know HDR is sort of, a lot of people don't like HDR, but HDR for landscapes does make a lot of sense. Like in this photo, it would be nice. This every All the greenery, all the vegetation is, is exposed all right, but the sky, there's no... There's no data from the sky. It would be nice to be able to combine two photos, uh, you know, one that's got the sky and one that's got the green. So it looks, obviously, if you were out here in the actual daylight uh, in person, you wouldn't see a white sky. So that's something I'm going to be trying to work on. This is looking east into the garden uh, from, obviously, outside the temporary fence. On the right-hand side, by that warning CPI security sign, there's a big old lemon balm bush, and that's the other bed that we've planted Maximilian sunflowers in. So you can imagine that seven feet high, you know, two meters high, we're going to have perennial sunflowers. And then to the other brick wall, there's going to be another line of seven foot perennial sunflowers acting as a windbreak. So the only place where wind's really going to get through is dead center underneath these trees. So we've got to figure out a way to slow down the wind here before it gets to the main garden. All the way on the far left, that's just one comfrey plant that's growing along with some blueberries. And that's the only picture from the 14th. That's the 15th. Here's the 16th. Let me check our time. All right, we're at 19 minutes. It was 20 minutes. Okay, we'll see if we can get done. I'm going to just flip through these. Doing some more chop and drop, trying to fertilize some of the blueberries with vegetative mulch you know you just put that it acts as mulch acts as fertilizers or breaks down it's a wonderful world here's a close-up of the first leaves from a black locust and you can see some other black locusts that are starting to pop up as well 
red clover flower situated inside some cilantro. Some kind of moth or butterfly on our cilantro. Alfalfa. I love the dark purple alfalfa flowers. Sometimes they're a little bit lighter than this. These were very dark. And the other flowers, of course, are mustard. And you can see, uh, well, maybe you won't be able to pick it out, but there's some insects in here, too. They're out of focus in the bokeh, but they're, which is a funny word. Anyway, here's uh, the southern-facing slope with our onions that are starting to flower. And that's all from that day. Let's go on to the next. I think this is when I've got a bunch of photos. Here's the 22nd. Yeah, I've got a ridiculous number of pictures from this one. These are Russell lupines, as you can probably read from my uh, tongue depressor. And they're a hybrid lupin. I, I bought them because they're pretty. I mean, they've, they've got a full range of colors that were developed in England. And they'll still, they should still fix nitrogen. And if they don't, well, they don't, but they're pretty. And so we've got some growing here. We're, we're experimenting with direct seeding as well as transplanting them out. Next up, these would be uh, false indigo, Amorpha fruticosa. It's a native nitrogen fixing shrub. It's a very large shrub, I think, edible forest. Sorry, I had a phone call that interrupted. Uh, this is a native nitrogen fixing shrub, about 20 feet tall. Um, I've seen Eric on, Eric Tonesmeyer, sorry, on the Permis Forum. He was invited out there, and that's really neat. Uh, I really enjoy the fact that Paul is able to draw these, uh, you know, the, the big names, these people who are really knowledgeable and willing to spend some time out in the forums answering people's questions. But anyway, he said this this could actually be chopped and dropped, you know, five, six times a season. So like pretty much as much as comfrey. Uh, so this is going to be a wonderful plant to have in the garden as a perennial nitrogen fixer, a woody shrub. It should get woody. Um, ninety nine percent sure on that. I could check, but I don't have the book near me. But this is going to be a wonderful shrub to have. And black locust, which is, as most people know one of the best uh, nitrogen fixing trees because the wood does not decompose for almost a century. So this is a great thing for building materials if you want to. So if we want to grow out, we've got I think 15, 20, more than probably about 20 black locust trees at least and most of them are actually behind the fence growing outside. If we let them grow until their trunks are about the size of a fence post then we can saw those down, we cut, you know, coppice them, and then use that wood to replace the temporary fence with wood that we grew that's not going to decompose for a long time. Then all we have to do is invest in some kind of, uh, you know, the, the actual fencing part. So maybe you, we could even harvest bamboo from someplace and use, make a bamboo and uh, black locust fence. And then as these coppice, you know, they're going to send up a whole bunch of new shoots. So then when those are a couple inches across, uh, you know, we could selectively harvest those as well, leave one liter and allow that to go up. And now we'll be able to replace the bamboo with black locusts. Who knows? So this is a really multifunctional plant, great nectary species, wonderful uh, shelter. Can't really speak too highly of it because I haven't grown it all the way to its uh, fullest, but it's supposed to be wonderful. Um, forget what this one is. We had quite a few different plants, and I had, <laughs> I have uh, the tongue depressors with the names on all of them. This one could be the Amorpha fruticosa. It really could. Actually, I think that's what this one is because we didn't have that many of them sprouting. So I'm not sure exactly what that other photo was. Um, stream of consciousness right now, trying to get through to 30 minutes on these photos. I'm not really sure what this picture is. I think I was really just trying to show uh, the difference between. Who knows? Who who really knows? But this actually in the in dead center, it's hard to see because the exposure is all crazy. Uh, there's Roman chamomile that's growing and flowering to the left of this clump of white clover. That's what those blown out highlights are. That's Roman chamomile. That's we just spread seed throughout the lawn trying to get it to compete with some grass. 
So we have something besides grass growing. Not a great picture. Uh, see if we can get to the next one. If the computer will keep up. We've got a new plant coming to flower here. Not just the yarrow, which is dead center with the white, but you can see these flower bulbs that are about to pop open. That's Monarda didama, I think it is. Uh, it's one of the bee balms. We have a few bee balm plants. This is one that we'd planted out before, uh, but you can see that we've got bumblebees growing, flying throughout the garden, and they couldn't wait until these opened up. When these open up and start flowering, there's a reason you call them bee balm, because they just attract all sorts of insects, including bees. Here's one out of focus, um, intentionally out of focus. He's sitting there on the leaf on the back. So you can see just they could, they're sort of waiting on it. Uh, but there are some species that aren't going to visit those. That's why I need specialist nectary plants. This is parsley. Parsley is um, just a crazy specialist inse insectary. And you can see these interesting looking bugs on the back here. We had a bunch of these. They were just all over the parsley. You never saw them anywhere else. They were just hanging out in the parsley, taking up some nectar. And cilantro too. They'd be on the cilantro if they really preferred uh, the parsley. And the parsley, a lot of our plants, maybe there's too many nitrogen fixers at this point already. We should probably uh, remove some of the nitrogen, excuse me, remove some of the nitrogen fixers by cutting them back repeatedly and replacing them with you know, more bee balm or, um, you know, even some more vegetables, whatever, but something else because you can see how leggy they are. I think it's partly too much nitrogen, but then it could also be that when there's so much uh, competition between them, they try to grow up quickly and they're all trying to grow really tall, really fast, and they fall over. Uh, so, you know, we put in a bamboo stake and wrap, give them a big hug with some twine to keep them upright which I don't really want to have to do too much, but I don't mind doing it for a few plants. And here, you know, hard to see what else is going on beyond abundant nectary sources. Just totally available. If you're hungry, come to our garden. Here's some peas that are climbing up the fence, starting to flower. So excited to see them flowering. We're going to get some peas. And then it's already getting hot. Yeah, what are you going to do? I did some yard work for a neighbor, and uh, instead of putting the shrubs out on the side of the street, a lot of these were evergreens, and look how thick these branches are. I took these, and I used them as a really thick, shrubby mulch on the southern-facing berm, uh, the southwestern-facing berm that's outside of all the fencing, so the dogs can get to it. I didn't want the dogs to be able to get to them, and I wanted to protect the soil because I knew it was going to get hot. You know, when you don't have a winter, uh, you don't really have too much of a spring and summer comes on and it's just like, bam, you kind of have a feeling that you're going to, I didn't realize that we we're going to have the craziest drought since the 30s in the United States, but, you know, call it a premonition or whatever, but the southwestern facing perm that we don't do anything to, that we don't water, threw some extra mulch on it by putting on these big shrubs and, and the foreground, the bottom right hand corner, we had some larger pieces from trees that we had cleaned up for him, and uh, I just stacked those up underneath the trees in order to act as a windbreak, like I had talked about previously. These are some tomatoes that are growing in one of the blueberry mounds that I talked about. Here's closer. You can see the uh, really healthy, healthy growth, uh, just nice, very good color, and you don't see any disease spots or anything, and they're already flowering. That's what you want to see. You don't water it. You don't do anything. They just come up by themselves and they grow. You know, that's what gardening is about. Here in the center, I don't know if you can see it right off the bat, but dead center to spot center, there's a uh, finch, one of these house finches. We, had a, we have a, at least one flock of house finches that come around now and they are looking for seeds. They love the brassicas. They just get on in there and here you can see this is a male. Uh, you won't be able to see it because I can't zoom in, but dead center is a male, and they're a little bit more red than the females are, and there's actually a female in this photo too. She's still up um, top left, top left, she's still there, and they just haunt, hang on to those stems, and they just crack open the seed pods, and they munch away. Some people, oh, now they're coming for my food. Uh, they're going to spread the seed for us. 
you know, not only through what they eat and what they poop as they continually come back to our yard, uh, but they can't eat all those seeds. They're not as, you know, they don't have a net underneath this plant set up and be like, well, we're not going to let any of the seed hit the ground. They're, gonna, they're making a mess. They make a mess. Birds make a mess. You know, that's sort of what most birds do. Um, now, I can see somebody, you know, if they had berries or something, they might get a little upset that the birds are coming and eating them, but... Um, you have to plan enough for everybody. That's that's one thing. Uh, and if your neighbors aren't doing it, then maybe we need to convince our neighbors to grow some more food too. So we're not the only restaurant in town. That That's one of the problems when people are doing this. We're usually the only all-you-can-eat buffet. And everything's hungry and they, they remember where your place is. And they're going to come after you. So that's why one more reason why we need to get our neighbors involved because... Sooner or later, the pressure from wildlife just gets so overwhelming because we're the only resilient ecosystem. You know, you go out to a state park or something sometimes, and you don't even see an understory in the in the forest. And you're like, "What is going on here? Where's the food for the animals?" Anyway, just here's some lettuce. It's gonna go to seed. Black-eyed Susan with some alfalfa around it and red clover. It's just a neat picture. Let's see what my time is. I'm going to have to combine two different uh, things here. So we're at half an hour already. Yeah, because the other one was about 20 minutes or so when I stopped it. Now we're at 10 minutes. Um, we'll end it here with this oregano and uh, call it a day on that one. I'll go ahead and start on my second section for May. But I just do want to, I do want to keep these slideshows around 30 minutes at a time. So you can watch it, get it done, and then load up another one later, you know, if I, if I don't finish like I just didn't do here. So let me pause this one, and we'll start up on the second part of May. Should be able to get through the rest of May in a 